The last of the Nephites are gathered together at Hill Cumora for the final battle of survival. The power and might of the Nephite nation has slowly crumbled over the last 80 years, and Mormon witnesses it from beginning to end. Alright, buckle up, because just like Mormon's account, we'll be covering a lot of time very quickly. It's 321 AD and Mormon's father takes him south to live in the populous land of Zarahemla, just in time for a war to start. The Nephites beating back the Lamanites after a number of battles. While there is no bloodshed for the next four years, Gadianton robbers do start to infest the land. Then another war begins and Mormon, being just 15 years old, is appointed head of the Nephite armies. Although it seems he does not lead troops in battle until age 16, this still ranks him as one of the youngest commanders I have ever heard of. After about a year leading at the front, the Lamanites attack with exceedingly great power and push the frightened Nephites north. The record says the whole land is one complete revolution, filled with blood and carnage. Gadiantons and Lamanites are everywhere. Over the next three years, Mormon tries halting the Lamanite advance three times, getting dislodged the first two times and finally succeeding in his third attempt, when he beats back an army led by the Lamanite king. It's interesting to me that at least according to this map, Mormon personally commands the defense of the western Nephite areas. Makes me suspect that he's appointed other capable commanders to fight in the other theaters, much like Captain Moroni many years ago. With Mormon being so young, I imagine there were plenty of older veterans to choose from, but who knows. Once Mormon stops the Lamanite advance, the invasion comes to an abrupt halt for roughly 14 years. There is no mention of the Nephites gaining back any ground during this time, so I assume the Lamanites use it to solidify control over this new land they've taken and consolidate their forces for their next invasion. It's worth pausing to point out that the Lamanites have been trying to conquer the land of Zarahemla for hundreds of years, and now they've finally done it. Last time they took this much ground was 400 years previous, only holding it for a year or less. Now they sit on it for 14. It's clear to me that the balance of power has shifted dramatically. It's also curious that Mormon makes no mention of any Nephite fortifications being built or strengthened during this 14-year lull. Doesn't mean they didn't. But regardless of how little or how much they prepared, the Nephites don't hold out. The next invasion comes and the Nephites get pushed way back. And then a little bit more, all within the same year. Just looking at the map makes me think the end of the Nephite nation has already arrived. But the next year, Mormon rouses the downtrodden Nephites with a patriotic speech and they stand their ground. Shoving the next attack back and then going on an offensive of their own for the next three years, beating the enemy army again and retaking a lot of land back. I'm not exactly sure how much, but regardless, this war ends with a treaty in which the Nephites give all the land southward to the Lamanites and Gadiantans. Wicked or not, these Nephites deserve a pat on the back for such a comeback. It also says a lot about Mormon's leadership abilities. Knowing the peace won't last forever, he spends the next nine or so years fortifying the new border, which I'm guessing is short enough to be considered a choke point, meaning he can focus all his military resources into one strong line of defense. The preparations pay off because the Lamanites attack twice over two years and are repulsed both times. The Nephites, feeling invincible and vengeful, start planning an attack of their own, which Mormon strongly opposes and refuses to lead them in. He makes it abundantly clear in his record that this attack will be a disastrous choice for the Nephites. Fight nation. Looking at it strategically, I have to agree with him. Going on the offense is inherently more risky. As mentioned before, the Nephites aren't the superpower they used to be. Instead of holding out in the nice fortified choke point they've been working on for a decade, crossing this border dangerously exposes what little military strength they have. In addition, I would guess that moderate voices in the Lamanite society, if there were any, that were pushing to leave the Nephites alone after the two recent losses, would lose support. By attacking, the Nephites would strongly demonstrate that they are an active threat. Thus, the Lamanite resolve to exterminate the Nephites no matter the cost only becomes stronger. And sure enough, the Nephites go on the offense, suffer a terrible defeat, and while they are still recovering from that, a fresh Lamanite army comes in and drives them out of their fortifications, killing many and taking many prisoners. Then the Nephites stop their advance and counterattack. The Lamanites strike back, pushing the Nephites farther back than before. This makes six consecutive years of what has been extremely bloody conflict all within a small geographic area, and the situation starts to deteriorate. Having taken the city of Tiankum, the Lamanites sacrifice women and children to idols. The infuriated Nephites attack and retake their land back the following year. Mormon says the hearts of both sides are hard. They are delighting in the killing. The Lamanites spend the next seven years prepping for another invasion. 
then come with all their greatness. The record sang with so many men they aren't numbered. After one sore loss, the Nephites fend off one attack but not a second. After their victory, the Lamanites return to sacrificing women and children to idols. The Nephites frantically gather all the people from the surrounding towns and villages and flee farther north. Mormon comes back to lead again, the Nephites finding great hope and strength in his return, and they successfully fend off two Lamanite attacks at the city of Jordan. Other Nephite cities also holding out for a few years, while all the cities, towns, and villages south of this perimeter are burned and destroyed. The Lamanites with their vast numbers of men are relentless, launching a large-scale attack again and shattering through the Nephite line of defense, the surviving Nephites fleeing farther north. It seems likely to me that Mormon writes a letter to his son Moroni during this time, in which he describes how ugly the conflict is getting on both sides, specifying additional crimes and atrocities. Sadly, some of these are not new to the ancient world, and others are ubiquitous to ancient and modern conflicts. Mormon now sends a letter to the Lamanite king, asking him to allow the Nephites to gather at the Hill Cumorah, where they would give battle. Mormon is hoping to gain some tactical advantage by fighting amongst the many bodies of water in that area. The Lamanite king accepts, I'm guessing pleased with the idea of having all the Nephites gathered into one body so he can finish them off. After gathering for three to four years, the Lamanites approach for the final showdown, and the Nephites are utterly destroyed in a huge battle at Cumorah. Some survivors fling southward until they are also hunted down. Mormon, before his death, entrusts the records of the Nephites to his son Moroni, who escapes alone to wander in the wilderness. The Nephite nation has fallen. The only other historic example I can find of such determined and relentless destruction happened over 500 years previous, when Rome decimated their great rival, Carthage. Over 100 years and three bloody wars, the Romans eventually defeat the Carthaginian armies, lay siege to the capital, level the city, kill most of the population and sell the rest into slavery. Historians can never agree on casualty statistics for any battle anywhere, but suffice it to say, the deaths at Camorra and the city of Carthage could be comparable. Read up on the Third Punic War for another sad tale on what many consider to be the first genocide. This has been a sobering video to make and I appreciate you watching it.